the month of August. It's a month where we are focusing on three different areas of missions through Hope Church. One is our local missions, two, our national missions, and three, global missions. Last week, we had Danielle Pena from Relentless Church in Las Vegas, one of our church plants. This week, uh, we get to celebrate with some special guests from Spokane, Washington. But before we get into that, I want to invite some really dear friends of mine, Keith and Mariska Buzzard, if you guys would just come up. They're going to make an announcement this morning and give you guys a little bit of an invitation. YWAM Lakeside, Montana, has always had a relational connection to this house and to this church from the very beginning of its foundation. And I have the honor and the privilege to be able to serve on the YWAM Lakeside Board of Directors with these guys. And let me tell you, they are pretty amazing. They are the base directors for the YWAM base here in Lakeside. And I, I can't tell you how amazing these people are. And they come to Hope Church and they love Hope Church. They serve at Hope Church and they serve YWAM Lakeside so well. Would you guys give it up for Keith and Mariska Buzzard? Thanks, Lance. Um, now I need another uh, offering card to pay for that. So um, you basically said my announcement. We've, we've been uh, coming here for about 11 years, and it's been an awesome privilege. And um, David Graham, who founded YWAM, um, actually was on staff with Hal Curtis and New Covenant a um, long time ago. And... When God called David from Southern California to begin a YWAM ministry in Montana, um, the Lord had him come up here first and, and serve in the community for a while. And it was in this church that, that God had a design and a plan for YWAM to be birthed out of. So we do have a long connection. And um, it's really great having uh, Lance on our corporate board. Um, we're really blessed to have him. Uh, participate with us in that area. And one thing I just wanted to say as well is that I was really encouraged just to hear how this is Missions Month and this is the deep water. We've been talking about that on our own campus, that the deep water isn't the love boat. It's actually something more like the deadliest catch where you're out in the Bering Sea. But in any case, so uh, my name's Keith, and this is my wife, Mariska, and we are the co-directors out at YWAM, and I'm going to let her um, do the, the big announcement. All right, thank you. So Hope Church, Wyoming, Montana, Lakeside is turning 30 this year. And so we are, yes, it's wonderful. We are celebrating 30 years of God's faithfulness in this valley. And we are going to have an event on August 22nd um, at the YWAM, we call it a YWAM base, at the campus in, on Black Hill Road in Lakeside. And we would like for all of you to come. Now, I know that a lot of times people wonder, what do, we do, what do you guys do out there? You know, tucked away in the mountains, and what do you do all day? So we want to show you. At 4 o'clock in the afternoon, we will have um, guided tours where we will take you through a, a tour of the campus, and then we'll have food trucks available. You can buy all sorts of fun foods from the valley. And then also at 6.30, we're going to have a celebration. It's, it's, we're, we're, we're gonna, that's going to be our birthday party. And you're all invited. And we'd love for there to be a Hope Church, Wild Montana blend that night. So we, you are all invited. We'd like for every single one of you to come. So we have a very exciting um, guest speaker that evening. A lot of you know Floyd McClung. Um, he is... Uh, the, uh, at this point, he is with All Nations Ministry in South Africa, but he is coming, him and his family will be coming to share with us in that evening. He's been a YWAMer. He has written many, many books, and a lot of you have probably read, you know, he's been just a missionary for many, many years. And so he will be our speaker that evening. We will have wonderful worship together, and then we're going to end the evening with a cupcake celebration. And the, the cupcakes are made um, with flavors from all over the world. And so it's going to be a really fun evening, and we'd love for you to come. So please join Join us on August 22nd at 4 o'clock. We will have the tours, and at 6.30, we will start um, the, the evening uh, event. And, uh, you know, if, you don't, if you're not into food trucks, we have the Tamarack out there. You can't go wrong with the Tamarack. So, all right. You're all invited, and we hope that you'll come. Awesome, you guys. Can we give it up one more time for Keith and Mariska Buzzer? Awesome. We love YWAM Lakeside. My wife, when she was trying to decide whether she would go to Lee 
college at the time, now Lee University, or YWAM. I'm so thankful she chose Lee University. Otherwise, I may have never met her. But we love YWAM. Love it. Love it, love it, love it. Now, I get really, this is an awesome day for me, really special. I love this month. You guys enjoying this? This is so much fun getting to hear from different people that you support. Do you know when you gave this morning, you gave to this church that we're about to introduce to you. And uh, we've been giving and sowing into Sozo Church in Spokane for a couple of years now. And I've been, uh, my wife and I have been part of their elder board. And this couple, uh, they're not only personal friends of mine, but they are some of my heroes. I have watched them toil in the ministry trying to do what you need to do to plant a church and see it be successful and, and to be used by God to reach a city for Jesus. And it is one of the hardest things in the world to do when you're plowing that new ground. And uh, these guys, I've watched them do it, and they've done it so well. And God's done some amazing things in Sozo Church and has blessed them. And I'm going to invite them up here in a minute. And when I do, I want to give them a real Hope Church welcome. So would you guys stand with me and welcome Mark and Ty Blair from Sozo Church. <laughs> Pastor Mark and Ty Blair. I'm going to brag on them a little bit more before they talk. They used to be the youth pastors here um, at New Covenant Church for a while and had an amazing, amazing youth ministry. A lot of you are recipients of that ministry. You're still here with us. Uh, but these guys are amazing people. And I'm going to give them a, a little bit of time here to talk about Sozo Church and what God is doing there. And then Mr. Mark Blair is going to bring us the word this morning, and it's going to be awesome, yeah. Hello. Well, my name is Ty, and um, we are so excited to be back. It's really awkward right now. Church is starting for us. And um, so I'm just kind of like looking at my phone a lot. So forgive me if I'm a little distracted. Um, we planted three years ago, and this is the first Sunday that Mark is gone. Um, so <laughs> we're a little anxious. Um, but we're very excited, too, because um, it's been this crazy season. We launched, like I said, three years ago, and it was us and one other family. And um, we have been in some really interesting buildings. I'm sure some of you came to some of them. Um, it was great. The world's greatest tree fort um, with all sorts of birds and everything in it. And then um, and God's just kind of moved us around the city. From there, he moved us out into the Valley of Spokane um, and just continued to grow the church. And it was a very slow start with, um, you know, one family and just really trying to get to know the community, get to know the people. Uh, moved us out to the Valley of Spokane. And from there, Mark was able to actually not be the only person on the worship team leading worship. Um, so that was a year and a half in. And it was such a blessing. We now have this professional musician team, and you guys, I mean, it's, it's like this. It's wonderful. It's so, um, just, they're so great at taking you into the presence of the Lord, and, and um, people are able to encounter God. So um, that was about a year and a half ago, and then um, we've moved to another building, and now we're in a different one, um, and this last move has been amazing. So um, like I said, it was us and one other family. Um, Plus children. So our daughter, Adoniah, is turning 14 next month. Um, I don't know how many of you remember, but when we first came here, she was three. And um, so now she's getting ready to turn 14. And then we had Malachi. He is 10. And um, Valencia turns six on Tuesday. So um, life is crazy, and they are part of our church planning team. And um, then we had John and Lindsay Prouty, who are also from here, and their kids are growing like crazy as well. Um, so if you guys never met Micah, he turns five on Wednesday. So, I mean, the kids are growing. They're loving the house. So at the beginning of the year, we were approached by another church, and here we are, this church plant moving all over the city. Um, and we were approached by another church that Mark and I were actually married in, um, and we went and did YWAM with. And um, so a lot of YWAMers have actually been to this church. It's called Rock of Ages, and um, it's in Spokane. They are, their senior pastor was getting ready to retire from senior leadership. So they've known us since, you know, I was in fourth grade. And um, they asked to merge with us. And it has been quite the journey these past what, six, eight months um, of getting to know one another, trying to um, 
just like, the whole the whole process is just crazy. Um, but it's been this huge blessing of teaching people to play nice and be friends and love one another. And, you know, all those things you teach people as you come together and get to know each other, especially because Sozo Church, um, we grew it and it was a bunch of 20-something-year-olds with small children running wild everywhere. We have tons of minis, um, which are preschool and under, and then, um, or kindergarten and under, and then we, that's it. You've got these young adults in college age, and we're joining with the Rock of Ages, which is an established 50-year-old church, and average age is closer to 60-plus. Um, so... It's been this crazy mixing of, you know, um, of people. And it's amazing to watch as the older generation starts to embrace the younger and the younger, the older. And, and you know, trying to ask questions about tattoos and piercing. And what is it you do? You add, I mean, we have this piercing artist in our church, amazing worshiper. And um, having a conversation with some of these established older ladies. And they're like, oh, okay. But then they're loving them and embracing them. And the same family is actually their foster parents. So they're connecting with other foster parents in the community and stuff. But it's this crazy weird mix. And we went from, you know, average attendance to about 80 to now we're doubling that and um, figuring out how to serve. We need more people serving just like you guys need it here. Um, you know, and that's how it, it got started with four, four adults and people willing to step up and serve and willing to get involved. And um, it's been this huge blessing. It's been crazy. Um, some days I, one day I went to work and I had my slippers on because I was just in such a rush to get out the door that I didn't put shoes on. Um, it was weird in the grocery store, but I made it and I got my work done. Um, but it is, it's a whirlwind, it's a blessing, and we couldn't have done it without you guys. We are so grateful to have had the time that we did um, at this house. It's it's coming home whenever we're here. Um, Ad and I was at the youth retreat, and for her, she just jumped right in. Um, she's loving it. Um, so it's a blessing to be here. We're grateful, and we're grateful for your continued support. I hope that kind of gave you a snippet of what's happening. I probably missed a bunch because, like I said, church just started. Um, but thank you again for having us. That's going to be fun. Isn't she pretty? Thanks. I'm just glad that wasn't a dude. Um, well, it's good to be back home. It's good to be here with you guys. We'll, uh, if you guys have more questions uh, about kind of what's happening at Sozo, uh, we're probably going to, I think we're going to be at the park thing tonight, right? Yeah, so we'll be there. I'll be um, really enjoying not swimming, so I'm happy to catch y'all up and answer questions, uh, <laughs> and it'll be a good time. Uh, I really, though, to be honest, uh, I don't really want to spend any more time talking about uh, our church, partially because, like my wife said, service is just starting, and this is the first time I haven't been there. Parents, do y'all remember the uh, first time you had to leave your kids, you know, leave them alone and go away for a while? You remember that anxiety? Yeah, I just left 200 kids. Um, they're all back home, and I'm nervous. So I, I would really like, if it's, if it's all right with y'all, to just jump right into the Word this morning. Is that good? Can we just get to work? Okay. So I'm going to ask you to do two things at once. Can you do that? So stop chewing your gum, because uh, you're going to have to do two things at once. It was a joke. It's Okay. Because sometimes it's hard for people to chew gum and do something. It, never mind. Go ahead and stand to your feet and grab your Bible or your flat screen and turn to Romans. Turn to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1 is real easy to find. It's right in front of Romans chapter 2. It's on page 1051 in my Bible if that helps anybody. Romans chapter 1, we're going to go to verse 15. Romans 1. Let's see if I can use this thing. Romans 1. 15, we're going to read 15 through 17. I'm reading out of the ESV. If you have one of those flat screens that can change it, you don't want to be confused as I read. I know some people have other versions. It's okay. 
can have a less inferior translation than mine, and it's totally fine. I love you. Romans chapter 1, verse 15, Paul here speaking to the church in Rome. He says, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. I'm going to pray, and then we're going to get to work. Holy Spirit, we thank you today for your living, acting, breathing, moving, shaking, transforming, life-altering, destiny-changing word. And we come to it today, God, not puffed up full of ourselves, but God, we come to it humbly, God, in reverence and in awe. God, we stand this day not for the words and opinions of man, but we stand this day for the very living word of God. We thank you that you didn't leave us here on this planet to wonder and to doubt and to wander about what it is you would say and how it is you would call us to live our lives. But God, we thank you that you gave us a living word, that you speak to us through your word. God, we don't follow cunningly devised fables that men have conjured up, but we, we follow you, Jesus, through your word. And God, I ask this day, I don't know how you do this. I have no idea how you, you in a room full of people speak a message that is for a people, and yet you open up and unlock individual hearts and speak to us. But that's the kind of thing we're asking for today, Jesus. We're asking for a message for every heart. God, I I came here today desperately in need of your word. I came here today, Jesus, desperately in need to hear from you. And I ask God that as we just come and as we open your word and as I ramble for the next few minutes, God, that you would speak to us. God, that you would speak. But if we come here and we don't hear from you, what's the point? God, I ask boldly, not just for the ability for you to speak, but God, we ask for the supernatural ability to hear you speak. Because God, we are, we are deaf. And so God, open up our deaf ears this morning. Speak, but let us hear. God, don't just let us hear, but, but soften our hearts, break open our hearts that we might receive what it is that you're saying. That as we hear you, we would not be be hard against what it is you're saying, but we would receive what it is you're saying. And Jesus, boldly, we even ask, God, God, we know it's a miracle for you to speak, and we we know that it's it takes it takes a healing touch for us to be able to hear you, and, and we know that it takes something beyond ourselves to receive a word that, that cuts against who we are. But but God, we would be so bold as to ask even more. We would ask God for feet to be obedient to your word. It does us No good to hear you and to keep living the way we lived before. So we ask God for feet to walk out your word. Let us be doers of your word and not just hearers. Let us be bold doers of your word, sacrificing all to follow you. And God, we give you all the glory and all the honor and all the praise. Let no one be glorified in this place today save you, Jesus. Because it's all about you, Jesus. And please help my church back home not to burn the building down in Jesus' name. Amen. I go ahead and have, grab a seat. So uh, this morning, I feel a little bit like Paul. I, I, I just want to preach the gospel. Now, we're talking about mission this month, right? We're talking about being on mission. And, and the reality is if we don't define what the snot we mean by mission, what's, what, what does mission mean? Is it, you know, we're, we're talking mission possible. Are we all going to put on lycra suits and be lowered down into bank vaults? I hope not because I love all y'all, but I don't want to see most of y'all in a lycra suit. I'm just being honest. <laughs> we mean I think the gospel has to be at the very center of what we mean when we talk about mission 
I find it interesting. Paul, if we're going to look from a human perspective, Paul is probably the single most important human that's ever lived. God used Paul. Okay, six of y'all homeschoolers are like, no, Jesus is the most important person who ever lived. <laughs> Jesus is God. Boom, I win. Um, Paul, Paul was used by God to write the vast majority of the New Testament for which the entire world has been transformed. Not just the Christian world, but the entire world. Wherever the gospel and the Bible and the word of God has gone, it has utterly transformed culture. And God used Paul to write that book. The Bible says we should give honor where honor is due. Paul's probably the most important person that's ever lived. And yet, Paul now is is writing a letter. See, all of the the books in the New Testament, uh, other than Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, were, were letters that were written to specific churches. So if you'll give me a little wiggle room here, they're podcasts, right? They're they're, they're messages that that God is speaking to people through his servants, the apostles. And what's interesting about the, 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 the epistle to the Romans is that Paul had never gone to Rome. All the other books, uh, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, uh, for, uh, Colossians, Thessalonians, all, all these books were, were churches Paul had gone to and most of the time had started. But yet Romans is written to the church in Rome, which we hear what we just read. Paul never even been there. And Paul, being this, this powerhouse of an apostle, God used him. He's probably one of the smartest people that's ever lived. He studied under the leaders of the Jewish law at the time, a guy named Gamaliel. He was his top student. He was extremely successful in his religious life. Uh, uh, On the flip side, he was an extremely successful business person. He ran a tent-making business that supported him and people who could travel with him. Paul was, was extremely good at planting churches. He planted churches in every city. All of them grew, reaching tens of thousands of people. I need that anointing. He was a world traveler. He'd been all over the known world at the time, something very rare at that time. He was was extremely gifted in in spiritual matters, having great grand visions and seeing amazingly powerful healings. And yet what I find interesting is Paul doesn't say, I long to come to you church in Rome and impress you with my intellect and tell you stories about all the places that I've traveled. I'm going to come, uh, Rome church, and for just 1995, you can come to my seminar where I'll teach you how to have a successful business that's very kingdom-minded. He doesn't tell stories about the great visions he's had. He doesn't, he doesn't go on about his, his great healing ministry. No, he says, I long to come to you to preach the gospel. So what the heck do we mean when we say gospel? This, I, I was here and other places. I was an intern director. One of my favorite things to do is to ask interns, what is the gospel? I would, lo- I would love, so college students who are like, I, w- I love Jesus and I just want Jesus, it's going to be awesome. I'm like, cool, day one, what's the gospel? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No, those are the gospels. Um, like, it's like there's like a Jesus and like a Easter eggs. And then he died and then there were nails and... Um, well, if we just watch The Passion of the Christ, I think I can get it somewhere in there. Can I just, we don't even know the gospel. So let me give you the gospel as quick and as easy as I can. Now I'm going to give you, that's a lie. I'm going to give you mo- far more than quick and easy. I'm going to try to give you the gospel in, in a little bit more robust kind of way so that hopefully you understand it better so you can share it with somebody. What we mean by the gospel is this. The gospel is the news that though we are sinners and objects of God's just wrath, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, died for our sins and rose again eternally triumphant over all his enemies, so that there is now no condemnation for those who believe, but only everlasting joy. You see, there is a good and great creator God. We know him as the in the scriptures as the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and out of the overflow of who he is, out of his goodness and his graciousness, out of his power, he created all things perfect and in proper order, all for his glory. He then gave to man all things richly to enjoy. However, we decided to rebel and blaspheme against God, choosing rather to say that we could pick what is right and wrong better than God could teach us what is right and wrong. We rebelled against him and blasphemed his name. 
Because God is a good, righteous, and just God, he has a good, righteous, and just wrath. Some of y'all are squirming. Listen to me. If a known, convicted, pedophile, rapist, and murderer stood before a judge and he was not angry, that would not be a just judge. If that judge did not punish that person, he would not be a righteous judge, would he? So how can we say that God looked down into the earth and because of our rebellion, the Bible says that everything is broken. Because see, some of y'all heard me say that God made everything good and you look around at the world and say then God is a crazy God. But the reality is the things that are wrong in the world are not God's fault, they're ours. We broke the perfection that he created because we rebelled against him. We blasphemed his name. And because he is good and because he is gracious and because he is just, he cannot allow that blasphemy to go unpunished. So therefore, God sent his only son, Jesus, the third member of the Trinity, to come and live a perfect life, to demonstrate to us the character and nature and perfection of God. And from that place of perfection, Jesus chose to stand in our place to pay our debt. Jesus was nailed to the cross and it pleased the Father to crush him, to pour out the totality of his wrath upon his son. And because of what Jesus did, and because of the perfection that lie within him, the grave could not hold him. And three days later, he rose, catch this please, eternally triumphant over all of his enemies. There is no more wrath in God towards sin. Jesus absorbed it all. And so now for those who repent and believe upon Jesus, we don't stand condemned before God, but we stand, come on somebody, completely forgiven, and I love this, ready to experience everlasting joy. That's the gospel. That's what we mean by the gospel. The gospel, as simply as I can put it, is this. You suck at life, and Jesus doesn't. So you should quit and let him live for you. Come on, we, we, get all, we get all huffy about that. Like, I suck it. I don't suck at life. You couldn't even find your keys when you're trying to get here this morning. Oh, like, God, I just want to be in control. And he's like, I got to remind you where your keys are, fool. Some of y'all put your pants on backwards this morning, and you're like, dang it. Come on, we... Look, look, I love you. I, I really, I, I'm sorry. I'm just preaching like I'm at home because I feel like I'm at home. I stood up here and preached up here for too many years to feel uncomfortable. I'm sorry. I know we don't all know each other, so just know that I love you. But listen, no one has failed you, hurt you, and messed up your life more than you have. So don't, don't get mad at me when I say you should repent and give up. Y'all got yourself exactly where you are. Ain't nobody put you there. And Jesus just says it's time to repent. Repentance simply means to admit once and for all, you're wrong. About what? Everything. I said that one. <laughs> I said that a lot. One time when I said that, this, this sweet little 90-year-old arthritic seamstress came up to me after church. She said, I'm not wrong when I agree with God. No, you're wrong, so you have to agree with God. <laughs> you need to understand, the gospel, simply put, is that we fail all the time. We don't fail because we, we could do better and we don't. We fail because we, we can't do any better. The Bible doesn't say that you, you are a good person who does bad things. The Bible teaches very clearly that you are a bad person. But Jesus isn't. Come on, I said Jesus isn't. Jesus is a perfect God. And Jesus chose to give us, in a scandalous exchange, his perfection for our imperfection. Jesus said this when he was walking the earth, that the kingdom of heaven was at hand. Do you know what that means? Kingdom means, uh, is, is the place where a king's will is done. 
I think what Jesus meant when he said that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, the kingdom of heaven was coming, the kingdom of heaven is near, is he meant this, God's desire for redemption is going to trump your desire for rebellion. That's the gospel. And Paul says, that's what I want to preach. Here's the creepy part. It's like, Paul, dude, you're writing a letter to a church. Yeah, we're going to see that here in a minute. Now, we're not going to go here as far as looking through it. But if you, if you would, just kind of jot down the word Jonah. The word Jonah. Jonah's a book in the Bible. If, if your Bible's like my Bible, Jonah's literally fits on just two pages. It's a short little book. Um, in, a, in a study that was done years ago, Jonah was one of the Bible stories that even non-Christians knew. It's so, it's so permeated culture that, that you don't even have to have like been you know, a homeschooler to have known the story. I was homeschooled, okay, calm down. People are like, he's mean to homeschoolers. Some of y'all are like, I was the meanest kid in my school. Yeah, and you were homeschooled. (laughs) And you only had a little sister. Um, Jonah's this amazing story. Jonah, catch you up real fast. Jonah is the story of Jonah got swallowed by a fish, right? We're all together. Okay, all the homeschoolers are like, no, it was a whale. There's only one word in Hebrew for an animal that lives in the water. It's the same thing, so calm down. Um, So Jonah gets swallowed by a fish, right? That's the story. So Jonah, let me introduce him to you a little bit better, though. Jonah was a prophet of the nation of Israel, which just simply means he was a preacher. He spoke for God to the people of God at the time who were the nation of Israel. God calls him to go to a place called Nineveh, which was one of the primary, if not the primary, enemy of the nation of Israel at the time, and to preach a message there. The message was, I'm really angry and you're all going to die. No, that was the message. (laughs) Some are like, no, Jesus is really nice. He has feathered hair and pets sheep. He would never say that. (laughs) No, that's what he said. He said, you're all sinners. You've all rebelled against me. You stink, and I'm going to come down and kill you all. And Jonah, shockingly, didn't want to go. Jonah didn't want to go, I believe, for two reasons. One, because it's scary to have to get up in front of people and say that. But primarily, we find out later in the story, he knew that God was a gracious God, quick to forgive. And he knew if he went there and he preached to his enemies that God, if they repented, would relent the destruction that he had in in store for them. And he didn't want God to relent. So he runs away, gets on a boat. God sends a storm. Storm rocks the boat. Fishermen who've lived their whole lives, or or seamen rather, who've lived their whole lives on a boat are freaking out for their life. So they throw everything they have overboard. It's not enough. They cast lots, which is a super spiritual way to find things apparently. And uh, they realize that Jonah is the problem and the reason why this storm is there. So Jonah has them huck his little rebellious bottom over the edge of the boat. Seems wise. And God, in his graciousness and his goodness, sends a fish a animal that lives in the water, according to Hebrews. To swallow his rebellious butt. Like Jesus, he spent three days there. And then the fish graciously spit his bottom back onto dry land. Jonah then goes, preaches the gospel, preaches this message of God's righteous anger toward sin. The people repent. The entire city repents. Jonah gets a book deal, starts traveling on TBN, and because he's such an effective evangelist. No, no, that's not what happens. They all repent, and Jonah gets angry, goes outside the city, and complains to God. I want to try to use Jonah here real fast, because here's what I want to do. I want us to see, when we say gospel, when we say that, 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 that we need to preach the gospel, who are we talking about? To whom ought we preach the gospel? Can we answer that question? Can we do that? Are we cool? I, you got to talk to me here, people. Can we do that? I'm going to do it either way. Just say yes. Okay. So here's what I think. I think there's three primary arenas where the gospel needs to be preached. I think the gospel is for three primary areas. The gospel, number one, first, foremost, the gospel is for the church. Oh, I will f- that doesn't make sense. If we're for the church, I think we're already into the gospel. We don't need the gospel anymore. Listen to me. You will always need the gospel. Let me quote one of my favorite theologians. His name is John Piper. You never, 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 
never, never, never, never, never, never, never, never, never, never, never, never outgrow your need for the gospel. I tried to come up with all night last night a better way to say it than that. I couldn't figure it out. You never outgrow your need for the gospel. You will never, listen, you don't start in the gospel abandoning your own efforts and then somehow embrace a better way to live and learn how to live. Listen, you don't need to come to a church and hear 16 ways to fillet a fish. You don't need to come to church and find 14 ways to discipline your 14-year-old. What you need to hear day in and day out is you suck at life and Jesus doesn't. You need to hear over and over again, stop trying harder and start trying. Trusting more. The gospel is not a better way to live your life. The gospel is the way to end your life and live it eternally for Jesus. We have a little saying. We say it every week at Sozo. It's all about Jesus. That message has got to so permeate the church that it is what we eat, it's what we live, it's what we breathe, it's what we sleep. It is who we are. For the church, for the redeemed of God. If you abandon the gospel, you've abandoned your only hope. Dang it. I was trying to get through a whole message without saying the word hope. I'm not going to look at Lance right now. See, I don't have this problem in our church. I've never once had to say like, Sozo in a message. <laughs> we can't abandon the gospel. We can't move past the gospel. I, I love this story. I love church history. Anybody love history? Uh, the great reformer Martin Luther, not Martin Luther King Jr., Martin Luther, he was a great reformer. Uh, and and he, he was the one who, or one of the ones that God used to, to start the Protestant Reformation. And so everyone had been in a, in, under the bondage of the medieval Catholic church. If you're Catholic in the room, we're cool, don't worry. Um, but th- at the time, the, 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 the Catholic church was a, a place of bondage and despair, void of hope, void of faith, void of an understanding of the verse we just read in Romans, that the righteous live by faith. They had abandoned trusting and moved to trying harder. And God gave a revelation to Martin Luther, of his goodness and his graciousness and salvation by grace through faith. And so he starts a church. And uh, there's a story that goes years and years after he'd started the church, some of his parishioners came up to him. Parishioners is a $6 church word that just means people who go to church, by the way. And uh, some people that go to his church come up to him and they said, hey, pastor, this, we really like this whole not Catholic thing. It's cool. But um, here's the deal. Every Sunday we come here and, like, the worship's good and we like the crackers you use for communion and everything. But, like, you just get up and preach the gospel every week. Like, all you talk about is this, like, by grace through faith, trust Jesus, don't try harder, trust just it's every week. Kind of implying, right, like, I think we, we can move beyond this to some grander revelation. Martin Luther looked at them and said, I preach the gospel every week because every week you walk into these, this, this room, this building, looking like a people who don't believe the gospel. See, the problem is the church has to be the place where we are saturated with the understanding of the gospel. Listen, we got 66 books written by 40 authors. We call it the Bible. It is filled with application and understanding of the gospel to every situation, circumstance, and problem, and joy, and and wonderful thing, and horrible thing that you could ever face. And it constantly pushes you back to Jesus because it's all about, you're making me feel like a lot more like I'm at home. Thanks. It's all about Jesus. You don't start with Jesus and then move on. It's all about Jesus. From start to finish, front to back, side to side, everything is all about Jesus. Amen? It's all about Jesus. So the gospel's for the church. The gospel has to be for the church. It has to first be for the church because, listen, I love you. If we can't live the gospel here, then the next place that it's for, it's never going to happen. Because the gospel is for the church, but guess what? The gospel is also for the city. Now, I know we're in a valley, but city starts with a C and church starts with a C, so I had to use it, okay? Just roll with me. The gospel's for the city. 
The gospel is for those people out there who still think if they just try a little harder, maybe they can get stuff to work this time. I, I love this, this, this journey into this merge that we've walked through has been extremely eye opening. So we, our church, Sozo, we, I call it Sozo 1.0 because that was the church before the merge. Now we're Sozo 2.0. Um, so Sozo 1.0 um, is kind of a church for people who don't like church. Um, the vast majority of our church, upwards of 90% of our church, either have no church experience or only very little, very negative church experience. So on, on, a, on a Sunday morning, typically when I want to turn to a book in the Bible, I have to explain every week, like turn to Romans 1.15. Find the big one and then the little 15. You're like, okay, cool. I had one guy come up to you after, he's like, dude, you don't even need to do that anymore. I got it on my phone. <laughs> click, click. I'll never forget this. It was our Easter service a couple years ago, and I, I said, turn to John. I don't remember what verse. John chapter something, verse something. It was clearly a really memorable message. And uh, I said, turn to John 15, 5 or something. And I hear somebody go, boop, boop. Siri, what's John 15? <laughs> it's like, Thank you, Jesus. And as a church, one of the things that has been birthed out of our church is we do this thing called Go Big Easter. It's similar to what y'all do here, too. We, we put on a giant Easter egg hunt for our, our city. We have giant inflatables, and, and we, we go around all the way around to the community, and we get businesses to donate money and prizes and iPads and TVs and bikes and free dinners out and ice cream and all, all kinds of stuff. And we hide them in the eggs, and then we throw them all out in a big field, and kids go get them, and we just bless the city. And People cry every, every year we do it and just kind of go, I thought churches hate people like me. Well, maybe you're mean. No. Um, <laughs> we just love and bless our city. And, and we did that this year, and we, we invited the Rock of Ages to partner with us. And I'm not going to name this person, um, but, but we're praying. that we had a prayer meeting the week after it. And it was interesting to hear people talk about to pray for lost people when they'd never been around them, and to see how their eyes were open to what lost people are really like. See, sometimes we can get so comfortable living in the Christian ghetto of a church that we forget that there's a world out there in desperate need of Jesus. Listen to me, not filled with bad people, filled with lost people. <laughs> this lady was praying. She's like, dear Jesus, just help them because I'm sure they don't even know how to love their kids. And what's funny is I've, if I've, as I've buried my life in lost people, you want to know the truth? A lot of them are way better at raising their kids than I am. It's not about the fact that they're some horrible depraved. Listen, every lost person is not a heroin addict, just some of us were. Okay? <laughs> they're like, what? <laughs> yeah. Okay, like not not it, it's not a matter of like Jesus is calling you. Look, being that the gospel is for the city doesn't mean that you got to go out and find a prostitute. It means you got to go out and find a lost person. And I guarantee you, God's put five to eight of them in your life right now. And they actually look to you for leadership. We got to stop saying, go change the world so we can just hide behind it. See, we hide behind phrases like, let's go change the world. Change the world. It's our destiny for a generation with our anointing. When was the last time you invited somebody who does not know Jesus over to your house for dinner. Change the world. No, invite your neighbor over. I don't really like my neighbors. Me either. Actually, I love my neighbors. Um, they're sweet. We moved into our house. We, I didn't realize this when we bought our house. God opened up a door for us to be able to buy a house. We were told we weren't going to be able to because we lost our last house. But Jesus is good, so he let us buy a house. And we buy this house. And... Um, we move in, and at the time, I was working for our local utility company because, believe it or not, 30, 20-something-year-olds who don't know Jesus don't tithe very much. So I'm really thankful that Lance here said that, that what you all gave this morning is going to Sozo. That was really generous of him. Um, <laughs> just saying. It was really nice. <laughs> um, I think we even have it on video. Um, so I went and got a job, college students, 
Did you hear that? I went and got a job. Um, it's a book of the Bible. Um, um, went and got a job, so I was working about 90 hours a week. I would I'd work at this uh, local utility company managing accounts and doing graphics for them, and then I'd pass the church in the evenings. And, and I was getting up in the morning, and I was <laughs> heading out the door at my house. And uh, I walked out the door, and my neighbor, her name's Alyssa, was bringing up warm uh, croissants and homemade jam. And here was the problem. I tried to find in the Rolodex of appropriate responses what you're supposed to do in that moment. And you know what? I'd never been trained on what you do when your neighbor comes to you at 6.30 in the morning and hands you pastries. It's just like, um, hot. Do you want to think? I. What year is it? I moved into 1952. I'm like, what? I literally, I just stood there and stared at her, and she goes, just take him inside. I was like, oh, thanks. And I walked inside. You can ask my wife. I'm like, Alyssa, these. I don't, I got to go to work. <laughs> so I love my neighbors. They're super sweet, except for the ones. Right? Come on. You like some of your neighbors, hopefully, but there's always the one. For us, I'm not going to say it because then they'll know because this might go on the Internet. But um, there's like one neighbor, and it's, you know, I realize those are the ones that God put there. Come on, for the gospel. I mean, thankfully, I'm a pastor, so I don't have to do this. I just have to talk about it from a stage. But <laughs> no, sorry, that's not right. Um, didn't mean to say that part out loud. Come on, the gospel's for the church, but the gospel's for the city. Come on, the, the, the existence of darkness is not an excuse for lights to turn off, but it's a challenge for us to turn on the light. And here's the good news. The darker the world gets, the less bright you have to be to make a difference. Really, it's getting to the point, I'm going to be real, it's getting to the point where you just have to be like mildly decent to someone, and they're like, there's something different about you. You just say thank you to, like, the Starbucks barista, and she's like, what? You gave me coffee. Thank you. Well, common courtesy has become an easy way to preach the gospel. The world has gotten so dark. Come on. But listen to me. The world has not gotten dark. The world has not gotten dark because the world has gotten darker. The world has gotten dark because the church has abandoned our purpose of being all about Jesus. We think people, see, I'm so thankful for having a relationship with a church like this that doesn't think people need uh, a how to live your life better classes on Sunday mornings. That's not what church is about. I don't come to church for somebody to tell me how to live my life better. I come to church to hear over and over and over again that I need Jesus. I come to church to encounter, come on, the living God because I need him more today, hello, than I did when I first repented. Because, see, I thought I'd get better at this living for Jesus thing. And what I've proven over and over again is the scandalous nature of God's grace toward me. Because at this point, I should be able to, like, spiritually tie my own shoes. And I can't. I just tie them once and slip them on. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. The gospel is for the church. The gospel is for the city. It's time for the, it's time for the church to make the message that we preach in the world. Oh. It's time for the church to stop making the message that we preach our pet political issues and start making it the gospel. So we merged our churches. And the church that we merged with thinks that Jesus was Ronald Reagan. They think that Jesus came to die for upper class white Republicans. And we got a church full of people who slightly disagree with that. Listen to me. Being a Christian and being a Republican are not the same thing. I ain't knocking Republicans any more than I'm knocking Democrats, Green Party, or whatever other flipping comp things are out there now. It's not about converting people to your political views. 
Do your neighbors know you as somebody who loves Jesus or somebody who has a political party? You're willing to put your favorite candidate sign up in your front yard, but you're not willing to go tell somebody who lives next door to you that Jesus desires for them to be saved. I got no problem with politics. I'm extremely political. I've just decided in my life to not make politics anybody ever hears anything from me. I want people to hear Jesus. The message the church needs to be known for is the gospel. Come on. Our joy and our delight is in the fact that God has flooded our lives. Last but not least, gospel's for the, gospel's for the church. The gospel's for the? Last but not least. So we see Jonah, right? He's a prophet in the nation of Israel, so he's preaching the gospel to the church. You, you with me on that? He then goes and he preaches to the city. He goes to Nineveh. Gospel's for the city. But then, and here's a really interesting thing. If you were raised in church and you've heard this story a bunch, that's where the story ends. Right? The flannel graph, that's all they have. <laughs> Does anybody else have a flannel graph when they were in kids' church with like me? Right? Like the flannel graph just like, and then Jonah went and he went, do, 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 and yay, they all repented and saved and end of story. The problem is there's four chapters in Jonah, not three. Jonah then goes on. Listen, Jonah goes on. He sits outside the city. Literally, he preaches the gospel to him. This is, this is how jacked up Jonah is. He preaches the gospel to the city, and then he runs outside the city to watch God destroy the city. Yeah, great pastor. God's gracious to him, so he causes a, a, a tree to grow up and to cover him. And he waits. And he sees that God is righteous, but God is also forgiving. And he relents of his destruction. God then causes, the Bible says, a worm to come and eat the, tree, eat the plant. So Jonah's sitting out in the hot sun. And Jonah, experiencing the greatest success he could ever hope for in ministry, says, God, you should just kill me. Why? Because the gospel's for the church. And the gospel's for the city. But listen to me, the danger of being in a church like this that's saturated, come on. With the gospel, the danger of being a part of a people who are on mission and desiring to preach the gospel to the city is that you will forget that the gospel is for the child of God. You need the gospel. See, the church doesn't just need the gospel. You need the gospel. So no, 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 man, I was six years old. Billy Graham came to my, count, my town. I went forward. I cried. I blew snot a bunch. I'm saved. I don't need the gospel anymore. You need the gospel. Jonah forgot that the only difference between him and the people in Nineveh was that he had heard the gospel before and they hadn't. Listen to me, you are not better than anyone else. You're just as jacked up. <laughs> You're just as messed up. You suck at life just as much as everyone else does. And that's why we need the gospel every week. Gospel's for, come on, come on. The gospel is for the city. It's for the church. It's for the child of God. So I'm going to land this thing now. I've already taken up more time than I'm allowed to, but I won't be here next week, so don't worry about it. I want to end with this. Romans chapter 5, verse 9 through 11. It says, since therefore we have now been justified by his love, or by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Everybody said? Come on, amen. That's a good place to say amen. We're saved from the wrath of God. That's a good thing. For if while we were enemies, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through whom, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Listen to me, if you're here this morning and you have not repented of your sins, listen to me, Jesus died for you. He has absorbed the wrath of God for you. He will reconcile you to the Father and God will become, please catch this, your joy. The gospel is not just, come on, fire insurance and a ticket to heaven. It is the reconciliation to make the God of the universe, the only righteous, pure, and just God, your God. 
and you his people. And if that is not appealing to you, I love you, but that's all I got. So I'm going to ask us to stand to our feet, and I'm going to pray and hand this thing back over to Lance. Listen, if you have not repented of your sins, I, I wouldn't ask you to. I will beg you, plead with you. Listen, it's your only hope. You are Princess Leia. He is Obi-Wan Kenobi. He is your only hope. All the sci-fi nerds are like, yeah, he didn't make a sports analogy. I don't got any. Listen, you have no other hope. I got no other message for you. If Lance ever invites me back to preach again, it's probably just going to be this again. So I hope they record it. You can just put it up on the video screen whenever you need to. Because this is it. This is all I got. You suck at life. Jesus doesn't. Repent. Admit once and for all that you're wrong and he's right. I don't care, I don't care if you've been in church 5,000 times. I'm not asking you to ask Jesus into your heart. I'm asking you to admit once and for all you are wrong. So am I. I didn't come up with this. I didn't write this book. I have to go to it every day and find out new and afresh just how wrong I am and just how right he is. And the good news is I'm his son and he is making me right. So I'm gonna pray for us and I would beg you, listen, if you're here and you've not repented of your sins, find somebody who is amening a lot in the message. That means they're probably a Christian and go talk to them. They know the gospel, they just heard it. It's time for you to repent, be reconciled to God. Holy Spirit, we thank you today. We thank you once again for your living and active word. We thank you for the gospel that breathes life into our life. We thank you for the gospel that gives us a future and a hope. And I'm asking right now, I'm asking right now for that one who desperately needed something. They came here because they knew they needed something. And they thought they needed instructions. They thought they needed, they needed a new plan for their life. And what they're hearing today, God, I pray, is they don't need a new plan. They need to abandon their plan and trust you. Not just for eternity, but for today. Not just for today, but for all of eternity. God, would you grant to some today repentance God, no more deciding to follow Jesus. No, I'm talking about deciding to die so that you might live through them. God, would you speak to believers in this room and call us and, and, and encourage us and equip us, God, not, not to hide behind a word like the world, but God, rather to embrace those people that you have put in our lives. Jesus, be glorified, be magnified, and exalted in this place. saved by your goodness and by your grace. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wasn't that good? Yeah. So if you're here this morning and you want to have somebody pray with you, right after service, to my left, we have a prayer banner over here. We have a team that would love to pray with you. You can stop by our Next Step Center. Jeremy's back there. He'd love to talk to you about God, your relationship with him, and pray with you. Stop trying harder. Stop trusting more. Man, that's good stuff. You know, listening to Mark, it's a little bit like going on a roller coaster ride for the first time that you've never been on before. Once you're strapped in, you're there, and you ain't stopping until it's over. <laughs> Scary as heck in some spots, but it's all good stuff. Thank you, Mark. That was awesome. So bless you guys. I have one announcement as we leave today. If you uh, are a servant here and you serve on one of our HOPE teams, um, we want to remind you we have our volunteer party for you in the park at Woodland Park this afternoon, 4.15 at the Woodland Water Park, and then 6 o'clock dinner in the park. And those are, if you are on a, any HOPE team, you serve in an area of ministry, you're all invited. Um, and, yeah. And stop by one of these booths on the way out and, and join one of these amazing teams. These are the people that 